has come. We have so much to be thankful and joyful about this morning. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, while the kids are being dismissed to Kids Church. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. And we are going to uh, be starting a little ha- about halfway through the uh, starting in verse 8 this morning. 1 Peter chapter number 3, starting in verse 8. Eight. And we are continuing in our study through the book of 1 Peter, uh, just as we've thought through what this Christmas season is really about and the coming of the Lord Jesus, the advent of Christ. And uh, we have been preaching about uh, how that when Christ came, he brought living hope is the way Peter characterizes it. Uh, it's hope that is alive and well because Jesus is alive and well. Uh, This hope is not foreign or distant. This hope is real, and it is eternal, and it is among us. And so we should be thankful for that and grateful for this hope that we have in Christ. I uh, had asked the kids in last Sunday in their children's bulletin a couple of questions to get them thinking about what the message was. And one of the questions was, what do you think hope means? Uh, What is hope? What do you think hope means? And this was the sweetest, most biblical definition I think I've ever seen written down on a piece of paper. One of our children said, hope means that you believe it will be okay, even if it isn't right now. And how true that is. How true that is from the mouth of babes, but how true that really is. That we can cling to this hope, we can embrace this hope, It's real, it's tangible, it's right in front of us, and we can trust in the hope of Christ today. And no matter what it is that we're going through, no matter what circumstances, no matter what difficulty, no matter what pain, no matter what suffering we may face today or tomorrow or the weeks to come, the reality is we can trust in the hope of Christ. The hope that we have is always reliable because it exists in Christ. I'm thankful for that this morning, and especially this Christmas season. That's important for us to remember. First Peter chapter number 3, and we're going to start in verse 8 this morning, preaching about living hope in the home. If you found your place, let's all stand this morning out of respect to the reading of God's holy word. First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and he's in his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day that you've made, the blessing of this day, and the wonderful privilege it is to come and to be a part of the body of Christ, to worship with our brothers and our sisters, and to lift up your high and holy name. And God, we're thankful for the joy that you bring us today. God, that this joy is real. It's not manufactured. It's not fabricated by any person in this world. But God, you have implanted joy in our hearts because we accept you as our master and as our Lord. And we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for this Christmas season. We're thankful for the hope that we have in you, that we can trust in you and go back to you time and time again. Lord, that you have saved us and redeemed us, that you give us an abundant life here on earth and an eternal life in heaven, and we're so grateful for the hope that we have in Christ. And God, I pray that you'd be real to us this morning, that you'd speak to us, that you'd move me to the side, Lord, and that you would, uh, Lord, that you would guide our words, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. (laughs) And you can be seated this morning. The letter that Peter writes here as what we know of as 1 Peter. It's full of principles and 
commandments uh, that are giving insight into Christian ethics, how we should live our lives, how we should respond in certain situations and scenarios. And he really just kind of undergirds his whole argument under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 by saying that the hope that we have in Christ is living hope, that this is real. You can go back, you can trust in the Lord no matter what circumstance that you may face. But but First Peter, when you read through it, it's full of examples that show how Christians should respond in certain circumstances and guiding principles. It's amazing, this little book, how many topics Peter is able to cover in this one letter and, uh, and what exactly he's able to talk about and to preach to those that are listening. He's, he's writing to Jewish Christians and he's writing to Gentile Christians, mainly in Asia Minor. Uh, in this particular time, but chapter 2, we, t- we, we can know this because in chapter 2, he tells them, he says that at one time you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And then there's other references to the Old Testament as well, so that kind of gives us the idea that, that maybe this is a mix of, 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 of newly converted Christians, maybe those that used to be Jewish, and then those that were also Gentile. Uh, so when you say a phrase like, you weren't a people before, but now you're a people of God, that's probably not something you would say to those that were Jewish. It's probably a mix of, of sorts. But, but now they're, they're new Christians, and they need guidance on how to live their life and, and how to continue to, to, to do what God has called them to do while they're waiting for Jesus to come back again. It's a theme all throughout the New Testament that the early Christians just believed and they knew. And it could have been, it could be tomorrow that Jesus is coming back. So they lived with the expectancy and the hopeful anticipation of the second coming of Christ. And we're no different today. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be a hundred years from now. What are we to do as Christians until the Lord calls us home or until He comes here to get us? What should we do? How should we respond? So there's a lot of things, especially in chapter 2 and chapter 3, that he touches on. He touches about how to, how to live under the authority of government in chapter 2. How to, how to live under those that have authority over you, that make decisions that impact your life. Uh, how do you live in the home? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, how do you live and interact with the culture that God has planted you in? And then he, he talks about in other places how you live and how do you endure suffering and pain and indeed persecution in the lives of, of us as Christians. How do you endure all of that while we're waiting, while we're hoping for the second coming of Christ? What should you do? How should you respond in those circumstances? Now, first off, this is not behavior modification. This is not Peter coming along and saying, that you can take all of these principles and you do A, B, C, and D and you're going to turn into a decent human and you're going to be a, a good, outstanding citizen of Asia Minor and you just don't worry about whoever is in charge of the government. You just keep doing what you're doing. This is not just behavior modification. And I want to tell you this morning that this is an extremely important ideal that we have to understand and realize and teach our kids and our grandkids. Trying, trying to change without the power of the Holy Spirit is legalism and is in vain. Trying to change your behavior and trying to become a better person and trying to, to change how you respond to certain scenarios and circumstances in and, on your own, in and of your own strength and in and of your own power really is vain and fruitless. We can only change, we can only respond the way God wants us to respond in this life to the power and the instruction of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at this, uh, especially in First Peter chapter 3, and we look at, at, at what it means to endure suffering even, what it means to endure pain in this world, and to do so with a smile on your face, bringing glory to God. Listen, we can't do that in and of our own strength. We can't do that by ourselves. If we were to try to do that, that's just simply behavior modification. And so we're not into that. We want to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit of God in the midst of all of this. So what Peter says is to do this. To root yourselves in the Word of God. To root yourselves in something that that is going to surpass, that's going to outlast whatever circumstance or scenario that you may find yourself in. Matter of fact, he says this in chapter 1. If we look at verse 22, we didn't get to preach about this, but this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the... Through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And so what he says here is that, listen, I'm going to give you principles that that God wants you to implement in your life, I'm going to show you how to respond in certain circumstances and scenarios, how to respond under an authoritative government, what to do when people have control over you, what to do in your home, how to live your home for the glory of God. How do you respond in all of these circumstances? But you cannot forget this. You always have to root yourself in the Word of the living God. That's what ultimately brings the change. Christ came as a baby. He lived as any human would live, Jesus, the second head of the Trinity, who was there in creation with all authority and power and glory, who has always been and will always be, came to live among us. And Peter says in chapter 1 that in his resurrection from the dead, we have living hope. We have living hope through Christ. And I want to tell you this morning, If you haven't already heard my heart in the past couple of messages, I want to tell you this morning, this hope that we have in Christ is a game changer. It will change how you live. Matter of fact, it it changed the course of human history, this hope that we have in Jesus. It's changed the lives of billions of individuals who have accepted the message of the gospel. We have hope for eternity. We have hope for here on earth. And Peter says this living hope, it changes who you are and how you live. Listen, I believe that when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and when I decided to get baptized and I decided to say I'm going to live a life for Jesus, the old man has passed away, the new man has came in, I believe there was a heart transplant that happened in the life of this individual. Where Jesus took out everything that was sinful, Jesus said, listen, I'm going to turn you into something wonderful and glorious, and one day you're going to stand in my presence justified because the gift of salvation is free for those that believe in Jesus. The hope that we have in Jesus, it changes everything. And I believe this. I believe this hope, this living hope we have, should change our homes as well. Christian, your home should look differently. It should live itself differently and distinctly from the culture. The reality is, though, that in our nation today, the Christian home on average, the Christian home doesn't look any different than the home that isn't saved, than those that aren't saved that live inside that home. The Christian home doesn't look any different than an unbeliever's home. And many Christians don't lead their homes distinctively today because there's, no, there's so much pressure, I think, to keep up with what everybody else in society is doing. And Christian, rather than taking our cue from the Word of God on how we should live and conduct ourselves in our home, we've taken our cue from society. Society has determined what the success in the home looks like. And can I tell you, you've been fed a lie straight from the pits of hell because we need to root ourselves in the Word of God. We tell ourselves we have to live up to what others say is successful. Ball practice, good grades, good, uh, good manners, extracurricular activities, dance recitals, providing a truckload of toys and gadgets for the kids on Christmas so they have a wonderful and good Christmas. Listen, all of those things, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with any of those things. All of those things can be really, really good things. But the problem is when these things start to become the end goal, we have lost our ability to live distinctively from the culture. When those things that everybody else is pursuing, especially around Christmas time, those things that we think we have to instill and to give to our kids or our grandkids, when when those things start to become the end goal, we have lost our ability to root ourselves directly in the Word of God and to root ourselves in what really matters. And by the way, let's just be honest. In the midst of all of that, while we're trying to live up to what society says we should do in the home, we're driving ourselves crazy. (laughs) How many of y'all, when Christmas time comes around and you start to fill in everything on your schedule and you start to look at everything that needs to be done, you start to see all the shopping that needs to happen, you start to see where every kid needs to be and grandkid needs to be, and you sit back and you wonder, man, why am I driving myself crazy? 
Listen, none of those things are bad things. But we have to take time and remember, I want my family, the Carter household, to be rooted in the message of hope that is in Jesus. Listen, if I mess that up, I might as well not do anything else with my kids. <laughs> forget ball practice, forget good grades, forget good manners. I want my kids to love Jesus and to root themselves in what really matters in the Word of the living God. What happens when the living hope of Christ changes the home? What happens in the midst of all of that? Point number one, you prioritize what really matters. When the living hope of Christ comes into a home, you prioritize what really matters. I want to back up just a little bit, and I want to look at a couple of other verses here in this particular chapter, and we're going to spend some time looking at what it means, what the home should look like. But let's look at verse 3 uh, to begin with, chapter 3, verse 3. And he's talking, Peter's talking specifically to ladies, and he's giving them principles that they should that they should be guided by. He says in verse 3, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair, uh, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So these verses are addressed specifically to women, but I think the principles are the same for all of us. The in some sense or another. The women at the time, they may have been tempted to wear things that were flashy or showy or to put a lot of emphasis on those things. But Peter says that you should focus on what's on the inside. What's on the outside isn't what is most important. What's on the inside is most important. And you're sitting here saying, all right, preacher, you're talking about makeup and jewelry. You're meddling. <laughs> Listen, this is not, it's not to say that these things are bad. These things are wrong. That's not what Peter says. Matter of fact, he doesn't give a blanket condemnation on any of these things. But in the same way, he says this. We can say that there's, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of this, but, but we have to remember that they, these things are not the main attributes that we should be pursuing. We should not be pursuing just simply these things. These are not the end goal because what God is really looking for, He's looking for the, the hidden person of the heart is what He says in verse 4. What's on the inside that really matters? Where exactly are your priorities in the midst of all this? And so before you all think I'm just preaching to the ladies, guys, we might not spend as much money on things making us look good, but guys have the same temptation with selfish ambition. Guys have the same temptations where, where we start to put certain, certain things in front of what really matters. Maybe spending more money on things that really, really don't matter. We, don't, we might not put on hair or, or jewelry or, or anything like that, but, but the reality is sometimes our priorities, our priorities get out of line. So what Peter is saying is that our priorities change when we stop serving ourselves and when we start serving Christ. That's really all it boils down to is that if we want our priorities to change, if we want them to be in line with, with what really matters and, and we want to be rooted in the Word of God, then we have to stop serving ourselves and start serving Jesus. Now, there may, may be people who have said, listen, I've accepted the gift of the Gospel, and I said that I'm going to live a life for Jesus. And I said that I'm going to devote myself to Jesus and what He's called me to do. But listen, in practicality, sometimes we have neglected this call. Sometimes we have sat back and we've said, listen, I, what I'm doing is perfectly fine for Jesus. But, but if we take a look at where our money goes, if we take a look at what we spend our time on, if we take a look at what we prioritize and what we emphasize in our families and in our homes, the question comes down to this. Are we prioritizing what we really matter? And are we serving Jesus and what He wants to see in our lives? You start to embrace things that are incorruptible that will ultimately stand the test of time. Peter says to prioritize a gentle and a quiet spirit. And God values the inside attributes of who you are. We might try to do everything we can to improve our family status financially or educationally. Or maybe even we want to improve other families and we want to help other families and, and to help improve their image or what exactly it is that they're doing. But listen, I like, I like what Mother Teresa said about this. She said, if you really want to change the world, Go home and love your family. That's what matters. I think that y'all can agree when you look at your own childhood 
You look at the home that you were raised in. It might not. It wasn't those things that, that you got on Christmas or the things that you were always provided for that really have stood the test of time. What you think back on and what you remember is, did my mama love me? Did my daddy love me? Did I know that I could go to them? And I could, I could tell them whatever was on my heart. We could discuss things because they cared for me, because they truly loved me, because they told me about Jesus. That's what matters. That's what we prioritize. None of these things are in and of themselves bad things. But we have to remember to prioritize the things of God first. And the closer we walk to the Lord, the more we prioritize God's priorities. The more we're in line with what God has has told us we should prioritize in our lives. So we look at those priorities and we see what really matters. Secondly, when living hope comes into the home, this is what changes. There is mutual respect in the home. Mutual respect in the home. I want you to look. We're going to look through verses 1 through 7 and we're going to look at, at what Peter has to say specifically towards husbands and then specifically towards wives and what exactly it is that we should be focused on. This is a word for both of them from Peter. It's similar to what Paul says in Colossians uh, that we've preached on uh, several months ago. Uh, But both of these messages drive home the idea that there should be mutual respect in the home. Why does the Bible Bible spend so much time talking about the role of parents in the home? Why did Peter specifically address the parents? Uh, and, And also in Colossians, Paul mentions the children, what their role is, but there's only a small little sentence there about that. Here, Peter is giving a lot of emphasis towards what the parents are doing in the home and what they should pay attention to and what they should prioritize. We're going to talk about several of those. But why is it? Why is it that he talks so much about parents in the home? It's because this. Parents, you set the standard for your home. You set the standard. You set the atmosphere for your home. You determine if it's going to be a place where children are nurtured and where Christ is honored. So it's it's not on your children. It's not on anybody else. Can I tell you this? Listen, it's not on your circumstance, as difficult as our circumstances may be. It's not on anything else in society. It's not the school's job to raise your children or to set the standard in your home. It's not the church's job to raise your children or set the standard in your home. Listen clearly. It is your job. You set the standard in your home. Why does the Bible say so much about parents? Because you have so much authority and influence in your home. It's on you. Even if your children are grown up. Even if your children are moved off. Maybe they've got children of their own. Listen, you still help to set the standard for your family as a whole. And here's what's amazing when I think about family dynamics is is simply this, is that as your children grow up and as they move off and as they graduate and as they start their own families, your position in their household is really one that has less to do with authority and more to do with influence, right? You can't go home and spank your 25-year-old anymore. (laughs) I mean, they're bigger than you, right? So it has less to do with authority and it has more to do with influence. And so grandparents and great-grandparents, listen, you have a very influential part of your other's family, of, of their household. You help to set the standard of, of what exactly that should look like. And we should take that, we should take that role seriously. But then, then I want us to look at this, because there's this dynamic between men and women, husbands and wives, and how critically important this is, and how, how God created the home, the structure that God put in place. Listen, it's not something that this preacher put in place. It's not something society put in place. It's not a social construct. It's not something that somebody thought up, hey, this is a good way to do the family. This is the way God said to order your family. This is the Word of God. And so he says here that we, first off, we see between men and women the dynamics of gender roles here in the home. We see this first and foremost. We see the value of men and women. The value. Of both of them. I want to look, I want to skip on down to verse 7 to begin with. It says, Husbands, uh, let me skip on down. He says, uh, about halfway down through verse 7, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Being heirs together of the grace of life. Men and women, husband and wife, or husband and wife, you are heirs together of grace. So, what does that tell us? That means, well, if you both believe in Jesus, you're both equally saved and you're both equally valued in the eyes of God. That's exactly what God is saying. It's what He said in Genesis, right? 
He created male and female. In the image of God, He created both of them, male and female. And after He looked at His creation, He said, It is very good. He blessed what He created. And so I want to tell you this first and foremost, before we ever start to look at the differences between men and women, or what men should do, or what women should do in the home or in the household, listen, we should pay attention to this first and foremost. God values you. He values men, and He values women. He sees that there are unique callings that they have each individually in the home and in society, being heirs together of the grace of life. God looks at women and men, and He sees value because He created both of them in His image. Sarah comes and serves in the church and helps me out in a lot of ways. But she has her own unique calling from God. She's a pastor's wife, and she loves to be a pastor's wife. But can I tell you, first and foremost, she's a Christian. She's saved. She believes in Jesus. Her identity is not hinged on me and on this preacher. Her identity is hinged on Jesus. And so listen, all of us today, if we're saved, we have value in the eyes of Of God. So we see the value of men and women. Secondly, we see the distinctions of men and women. There are distinctions between men and women. Amen? There are distinctions. And listen, I've noticed this with with Jack and with Maggie. Maggie cries differently than Jack did. I mean, it's, it's in so many ways, it's, it's, it's a lot cuter than Jack did when he, when he was her age. But 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 Peter talks about these differences between men and women. And and for the Christian, listen, when we get into this, when we get into this, for the Christian, submission is not a bad word. When you look at this and you think, well, wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. Listen, all of us are called to submit. Women, we are called to, uh, they're called to submit to their husbands. Men, you are called to submit to the Lord, to give preference to Him and to His leadership in everything uh, that you do. All of us. The Christian life is a call to submit. It means to simply show preference for others and for the Lord. Women should trust the spiritual leadership of their husbands, and men should submit themselves to serving their family. So here, here's essentially, men, here's what you're submitting to. You submit yourself to everybody else in your family. You submit yourself to giving yourself over to your family, to serving your family and to serving God. And men, we need to do that well and take that calling from God seriously. Paul says that we are to essentially be willing to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Man, what sacrifice. What sacrifice we should be willing to give our families. But here's the reality. We're living in a chaotic and we're living in perilous times because the structure and the order that God has established is seen by many today as oppressive. It's seen as antiquated. It's seen as patriarchal. It's seen as dogmatic and intolerant. But listen, God has created us differently for a reason. There is beauty in our distinction. Beauty in the, those distinctions. So, so listen, he says, Wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even some that do not obey the word, they, without a word, will be won by the conduct of their wives. What a wonderful witness. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let the adornment of your hair, as we've talked about, but then let's skip on down to husbands. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, give an honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, as, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. How important this is. God has made us differently for a reason. I had an anthropology professor when I was a freshman in college, and it's been several years ago now, and... Uh, this was before we've heard so much about gender fluidity and, and all of these sorts of things. But my anthropology professor had just had a baby. And I remember walking to class one day, and she was telling me about uh, her child. And she said that uh, the child has a gender, but uh, she's raising her kid gender neutral. And she's not going to change the colors in the room, and she's getting gender neutral clothing for the baby and eventually is going to raise the baby in that environment where that baby will be able to determine their own gender. This was several years ago, and I thought to myself, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I was a freshman in college. (laughs) I didn't know a lot. I still don't know a lot. But that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And listen, I, I say that because I do believe we have to be truthful in 
the culture that we live in. And I, I do believe this, that even in the midst of that, even in the midst of that, we can be truth tellers, but we can, we can be loving and we can show compassion. Listen, it's dumb because I love that baby. That baby is created in the eyes of God. And, and, and that's not what God wants for that baby. That we should value that life. That life that God has brought in to this world. So God has created us differently. Sure, they can be interested in other things. Sure, they can be interested in things that maybe society says a boy shouldn't do or a girl shouldn't do or whatever. Kids are going to play around with stuff. Girls interested in sports. Perfectly fine. Boys interested in cooking. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But at our core, there's something different about how we how we were created. And that's more than okay. Listen, it's okay that men and women are different and distinct because that's God's design. That's God's design. And there is beauty, beauty in God's design. I remember when we went out to Wyoming a couple of years ago, and we went for Christmas a few years ago, and uh, me and Sarah, we're, we're just really we're opposites in so many ways, but the Lord brought us together, and it just worked so well. And uh, she's pretty, and I'm ugly, and, and uh, I'm married up, and she married down, and uh, just opposites, really. And, but we went, to, we went to Wyoming for Christmas one year, and uh, we, they said, Sarah, you want to go outside and, and uh, feed the cows? And Sarah is a southern lady, and, you know, she's makeup, hair, getting everything fixed up, and that's who she is. And uh, she's all about sweet tea and Jesus. And she's got the monogram bag that says sweet tea and Jesus. And, you know, she's, she's just a lady. And uh, she said, well, her, in her mind, when they said, let's go feed the cows, she was thinking like getting hay and going over to peppermint farms and just letting the cows eat out of her hand and how sweet and how beautiful that was going to be. Well, we walked out there and they, they put her in the back of a flatbed pickup truck. And it was about 15 degrees outside. It was, about, it was cold. And, uh, and they gave her a pitchfork and they said, All right, we're going to hit the gas and you just start feeding. And so she stood in the back of that pick, uh, pickup truck. And as they were going, she started shuffling and they hit the gas and she fell back over just like this. And man, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. But, but it's funny now. I don't, did I, I don't think I laughed then, but I probably did. But, but it. It's just really an illustration to show us, listen, we're different. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. It's, it's in God's design that we're created differently from one another, men and women, husbands and wives. And, and in our day, this is, what, this is really what bothers me and what's mind-boggling about this. In our day, chivalry is treated as chauvinistic. It's treated as toxic manhood. Listen, listen, what's wrong with opening the door for a lady as they walk into a room? What's wrong with, man, you picking up the box because it's heavier? <laughs> I made Sarah tote a box in this morning, and somebody caught me on the way into church. <laughs> but listen, it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, it's being caring. It's being loving and compassionate for your spouse and for the person that God has put you together with. Men and women are created differently. We see the distinctions, but then we see the completing roles of men and women. They say opposites attract, and there's a lot of truth to that. What I do know is, biblically, men and women were created to complete one another. To complete one another. They may look different from, they may look different from every home in some way, but, but God has gifted you to help complete the other person. Look at what verse 7 says, men. That you give honor to your wives. And, uh, and then it says this later on, that your prayers may not be hindered. So this is what it means. How you treat your spouse, how you treat the other person in your home, it impacts your spiritual well-being. It impacts your relationship with the Lord. We're supposed to complete one another. Some say, happy wife, happy life. And, and at times I've said that. Amen and amen. But I like this too. Happy spouse, happy house. That we're supposed to love one another, supposed to care for one another. That we're supposed to give preference to the other. And we're supposed to help complete one another. Listen, some people can't complete one another because they're too busy competing with one another. They're too busy trying to fill the role that God gave your wife or that God gave your husband. And listen, what, what I can do, Sarah can't do. And what Sarah can do, I definitely cannot do. 
That's how God created us. That's what, he, that's what He's given us to do. So we see the completing roles of men and women in the home. But then what happens in closing? i got a couple more points. What happens when the living hope of Christ comes into the home? Thirdly, there is unity in the home. There's unity in the home. Would you look with me to verse 8? Finally, and he's given a summation of what he said. Finally, all of you be of one mind. Listen, I love weddings. And I love officiating weddings and doing weddings. But there's been a few that I've been to and I thought, man, this, this isn't off to a good start. <laughs> and I, I'm just the realist sitting in the pew sometimes. Or maybe I'm the realist sitting and doing the wedding ceremony. And, uh, you know, some of them today, they're focused on the love that they have for one another. And, and I remember one song, it was like Celine Dion. And they were singing something like, I will always love you. And I remember sitting back, one day you're going to hate that person. <laughs> one day you ain't going to love that person. You're going to wake up and you're going to say, man, I can't stand that person over there. And listen, you're not going to go back to your wedding and say, well, hey, we, had, we sung a song and we said we would always love each other. Listen, one day, one day, you're going to get to a point where you've got to root yourself in something deeper than your spouse. One day you're going to get to the point where you've got to say, listen, there's got to be something that's stronger, that binds us together, stronger than our love for one another, stronger than our love for our children, stronger than our love for what we've established and what we've been given. We've got to root ourselves in the binding love of Christ. Stronger than anything else. That is what unifies the home. And can I tell you this? Your home will only be unified when Jesus is at the core. Jesus has to be at the core. Lastly, we see this in the home. When living hope comes into the home, we see this. Compassion becomes common. Compassion becomes common. Look at what he says. Having compassion for one another, love as brothers. Not returning evil for evil. Having compassion for one another. Wouldn't you love today, maybe, maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking about your, this morning you're thinking about your home and you're thinking about others' homes that you love and that you care so much about. And you just wish that, that the compassion that the Bible talks about, you wish it was more common in your household. Listen, when we, when we bring Jesus into the mix and we, when we start to prioritize and serve Jesus above ourselves and above anybody else, and we say that we want to be bound together by the love of Jesus, not just by what the world has to offer. Listen, I believe that when living hope comes into the home, when it shows up, compassion will become common. We need to believe that. But there are some things that we can do that will lead us to that point or to help make it to that point. Peter says this, and he quotes the Old Testament, that shows, that illustrates what it means when compassion becomes common in the home. What can we do? Look, look at what he says in verse 10. He quotes the Old Testament. He who would love life and see good days, let him do what? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Maybe that's something that needs to happen in our homes today. Listen, I've been in situations in our house, and I've said something, and immediately I thought, <clears throat> shouldn't have said it. And you've been there too. You've been there too where it just rolled off your tongue. You said it before you thought about it. And, and what that helped to do is that it, that it added up into these small little instances, and it starts to culminate into bigger instances and bigger issues that take place in your home and in your family. And when you do that, when you just let it roll off your tongue, whatever it is that you want to say, listen, compassion is pushed out the door, and we start to say that we're serving ourselves over anything else. So if we want compassion to become common in our home, we want to live the living hope of Christ in our home, here's what we should do. Sometimes we need to hush, hold our tongue, think before we speak. Secondly, we can do this. We can seek peace. It says in verse 11, let him... Turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Sometimes when homes live in chaos, it starts to, starts to turn into where our homes are thriving off of chaos. And can I tell you, for the Christian home, we should live differently and distinctively. And in the Christian home, there should be an element of peace that passes all understanding that lives in your home. That lives in your home. And we should seek this peace. And we should pursue this peace. But then lastly, if we want compassion to become common, we have to do this. We have to serve the Lord. He says in verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, 
and the ears are open to their prayers. So here's what we do. We serve the Lord. We ultimately give our families over to the Lord. And we say, I know that this living hope of Christ has changed my heart and has changed my life. And I want it to change my home. I want it to change my family. I want it to impact how we live together, how we conduct ourselves together as a family. And maybe it's between you and your husband or you and your wife or maybe it's between you and your kids, but you pray for this living hope to come in your home. Listen, there will be distinctions in your home when you do that, when you allow Jesus to come in and you say, we're going to put Jesus first and foremost above anyone else or anything. As for me and my house, today we will serve the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful that we can submit our lives to You. We can submit, Lord, our souls into Your very care. God, we want to submit our homes into Your hands today. God, I pray that today we would live distinctively. That we would commit ourselves to living a life for You. God, far too often, unfortunately, the Christian home in today's society looks too much like an unbeliever's home. God, it's chaos. It's disorderly. It's not created in the pattern that you've given us in so many ways. And God, I pray that you would enter into our homes, that you would be welcome in our homes. Lord, that today as believers and as followers of Jesus, we would open wide the doors of our home and we would say, this is a place where you're welcome. Lord, I pray that you would send your living hope to go in and change the lives of the individuals in that home. God, I pray that you would help us to remember that it's not just behavior modification. It's not just trying to get everything right ourselves. God, it's it's trusting in you. It's putting all of our hope in you. It's saying that, that your will is greater than my will. Your plan is greater than my plan. The structure that you've laid out for my home is greater than the structure that I have for my home. It's more effective than anything I could ever come up with. And God, I pray today that, Lord, when we look at the state of the family in society as a whole, God, I pray our hearts would break. I pray our hearts would break and that we would repent. God, that we would recognize that Your way is better. God, what's happening today is heartbreaking in the sense that each and every man is pursuing whatever they see fit. Each and every woman is pursuing whatever they think needs to happen in their home and how they raise their children and their grandchildren. And Lord, we have to be honest with ourselves and admit that we've ended up in a mess. God, I pray today, maybe there's somebody that doesn't know you, in the free pardon of sin that hasn't accepted you as their Lord and as their Master. God, I pray today could be that day. Lord, maybe their home can't be a home that glorifies you because they're not living a life that glorifies you. They're not living for you as individuals. God, I pray maybe today there's some women, there's some wives and mothers that need to come down here and need to submit their homes into your loving hands. God, maybe there's some men and husbands, Lord, that you know you've you've been speaking to them for a long time, that they need to surrender. They need to give it all up and they need to give it all into your hands. They need to trust in your leadership if they're ever going to do what you've called them to do in their families and in their homes. God, I pray they trust in you today. Lord, we give you all the glory. We want to surrender and submit ourselves into your hands. We want this living hope to change who we are, how we live, and how we glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Would you stand together?